Good morning and welcome to Broadmeadow. Here at Broadmeadow, no matter where you've come from or you're going, what you believe or doubt, what you are feeling or not feeling, what you have or don't have, and no matter whom you love, all of who you are is welcome into this community of faith by a God who loves you passionately. Thanks be to God. The hymn of praise this morning is Holy, Holy, Holy. It's number 64 in the hymnal. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please rise in body or in spirit as we sing together. Methodist Church on this Trinity Sunday. We're so happy all of you could be here this morning with us, whether in person or online. As we begin this time of worship, let's open up in prayer. Lord God, who brings us mornings and beginnings, touch our heart to hear your call today. Grant us faith to rely on your extraordinary power in us that the life of Jesus may be made visible as we glorify you alone. Amen. Please remain risen for our affirmation of faith. The Apostles' Creed found on page 881 of your hymnal or the inside of your bulletin. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and holy, and it is that church's faith we now proclaim. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
prayer for illumination. Shine in the darkness, O God, and shine in our hearts, so that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may grow in the knowledge of your glory, proclaiming Jesus Christ and not ourselves, until his life is made visible in us, even in us. Amen. And our um, New Testament reading is from 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 12. We don't preach about ourselves. Instead, we preach about Jesus Christ as Lord. And we describe ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. God said that light should shine out of the darkness. He is the same one who showed in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay pots so that the awesome power belongs to God doesn't come from us. We are experiencing all kinds of trouble, but we are not crushed. We are confused, but we aren't desperate. We are harassed, but we aren't abandoned. We are knocked down, but we aren't knocked down. We always carry Jesus' death around in our bodies, so that Jesus' life can also be seen in our bodies. We who are alive are always being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that Jesus' life can also be seen in our bodies that are dying. So death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm today comes from Psalm 139. You can find that on page 854 of your hymnal. We'll read 1 through 6 and 13 through 18. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it all together. You pursue me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. And to 13, for it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for you are fearful and wonderful. Wonderful are your works. You know me very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written the days that were formed for me, every day before they came into being. How profound to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The hymn of preparation is Of the Father's Love Begotten. It's number 184 in the hymnal. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. begotten ere the worlds began to be He is Alpha and Omega He the source, the ending He of the things that are that have been and that future ye shall see Evermore and evermore. Christ to thee with God the Father, and O Holy Ghost to thee, Him enchant in high thanksgiving, and unwearied praises be. Honor, glory, and dominion. And he 
eternal victory. Evermore and evermore. Our gospel lesson today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 2, 23 through 3, 6. Please rise in spirit or body for the reading of the gospel. Jesus went through the wheat fields on the Sabbath. As as the disciples made their way, they were picking the heads of wheat. The Pharisees said to Jesus, look, why are they breaking the Sabbath law? He said to them, haven't you ever read what David did when he was in need, when he and those who were with him were hungry? During the time when Abiathar was high priest, David went into God's house and ate the bread of the presence, which only the priests were allowed to eat. He also gave bread to those who were with him. Then he said, the Sabbath was created for humans. Humans weren't created for the Sabbath. This is why the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Jesus returned to the synagogue. A man with a withered hand was there. Wanting to bring charges against Jesus, they were watching Jesus closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And he said to the man with the withered hand, step up where people can see you. Then he said to them, is it legal on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they said nothing. Looking around at them with anger, deeply grieved at their unyielding hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he did. And his hand was made healthy. At that, the Pharisees got together with the supporters of Herod to plan how to destroy Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and indeed the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. When I was a kid, one of my favorite cartoons was Transformers. If you don't know what Transformers is, if you weren't a kid in the 80s, or you didn't have a kid in the 80s, or you just weren't paying attention to cartoons like I was at the time, Transformers were giant robots from another planet that turned into other things like cars or planes, sometimes dinosaurs. Transformers, the the logo or the, the catchphrase of Transformers were, they were more than meets the eye. I watched that cartoon every day after school. Every day. I loved that cartoon. And I, I really wanted the toys. These and Transformers were, the toys were big metal toys. And it would, they were so complicated, but I loved them. I loved like taking them apart and putting them back together as planes or as, as cars or tanks or whatever. Um, but they were, uh, they were too expensive for me to have more than a couple of them. <laughs> That's my mom, everyone. <laughs> I just, I could, I mean, they were too expensive. They were too expensive. And I, I, now when I have a kid, I absolutely understand that they want more than maybe you can afford. But I got GoBots, which were plastic. They were kind of the, the off-brand Transformers. They were pretty much exactly what met the eye, though. But it's not just Transformers. It's, there's always been, to me, something cool about, about things that are more than they, than they seem. So I've always liked superheroes, right? Clark Kent. It's Superman. Bruce Wayne, a rich playboy, is actually Batman, the Dark Knight. Peter Parker, a nerdy high school kid, is actually Spider-Man. I love this idea of... of People of things being more than they seem. Second Corinthians, the book of Second Corinthians, is like it sounds, Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. And, and many scholars actually think that Second Corinthians may not just be one letter, it may be a bundle of letters from Paul that, that kind of were 
passed down and, and finally copied by themselves, or together as one book. But throughout this epistle, Paul is directing the hearts and the eyes of the church in Corinth, and ultimately throughout the world, to see some things that aren't evident on, in, on first glance. Throughout 2 Corinthians, Paul is directing the church to see God's presence. No matter how difficult it might be to see, there is more going on than what it looks like. There's more than meets the eye. The church in Corinth at this time was, was divided into factions, different groups of people. Different groups following different teachers. Some were, were Paul's people, so to speak. They said, no, we, we listen to Paul. We are Paul's disciples. Some, some were a guy named Apollo. Some were other teachers that had come through. I mean, there's not like, this is not a time when, you know, we have what, what we think of as denominations or anything like that. It's just the whole church is kind of meeting together. There's not many of them, but, but they're already breaking into different groups saying, oh no, we listen to this one, we listen to that one. And some of them, of course, say, no, we don't listen to any of these people. We just follow Jesus. And we follow Jesus the way that this guy told us to. Paul, though, Paul isn't flattered by those who say that they are, they are Paul's disciples. He's not. He's not flattered by this. He's not trying to convince them that they should all be followers of Paul. He says, look, I didn't come to preach me. I didn't come to preach Paul. And Apollos didn't come to preach Apollos. And, and all of these other Disciples, all of these other teachers, they didn't come to preach themselves. We all, together, all of us came to preach Christ. We all came to tell you about Jesus. And so, you may have just missed the point if you're dividing up into factions around that. Paul says, look, I need you to listen to what we're saying, not who we are. Listen to the, the message that God has given us to give to you, because it's not about us. God has given us this message, but our God has given you this message too. This message of salvation, of forgiveness, of love, of grace, that's, that's what we're doing here. That's what we're talking about. We, we, all of us who have been through here, all of us who are talking to you, all of us who have preached to you and teach to you, all of us who have worked so hard to set this church up, it's not about us. We're just the messengers. We're just the messengers. And it would be better for you to forget about us and who we are than it would to start breaking up into groups, paying too much attention to us. I mean, I, I get what Paul is is talking about here. I mean, I, I don't I don't think I've ever had a, an entire group of people or a faction of people develop around me, but I know that the point of of preaching. And I feel the weight of this every Sunday. The point of preaching is not to direct your attention towards me. It's not about me. If in a year you remember the message of God's grace and the message of God's love and you don't remember who told it to you, I'm okay with that. I think that's a good thing. I want you to hear the message, not pay attention to the messenger. But Paul, Paul makes a really, to me, interesting and fascinating example, metaphor. He says, look, you've heard the message. You've heard it. But it's been delivered to you in clay pots. Because that's what we are. 
just clay pots. Clay pots would, 2,000 years ago in the Mediterranean, clay pots would be cheap, disposable storage. Something that could be made in a day, and if it was broken or lost or someone took it, it wouldn't be a big deal. In 21st century America, it might be, look, this, this great treasure is in a plastic bin you bought from Walmart. It's just disposable. But that's what makes all of this all the more amazing. It's what makes the message all the more amazing and the response from the church all the more amazing. You see, God has entrusted us, not just those of us who are called into ordained ministry, into preaching, but all of us who are Christ's disciples. God has entrusted us with this amazing, beautiful wonderful message, this message that God, the God of the universe, the God who created all that is, has seen us and loves us and cares for us and became one of us in the person of Jesus Christ, became one of us and lived and taught us to love one another and died on our behalf and defeated death and walked out of the tomb and left for us the Spirit of God to keep us going, to carry out the the message and the ministry that He started. That is what we have inside of us. This is the message we have. This is... This is the calling we have inside of us. And we are just clay pots. We are imperfect. It's not from our own effort. It's not from our own goodness. It's not from uh, how wonderful we are that this message comes. No, it's from God. God has given us, in all of our imperfections, this message to proclaim and to live, and to be an example of. And there's no way that that could come from us. There's no way it could. And so, God, and so people can, can see when we are living and, and proclaiming the message that God has given us, they can't help but see what God is doing through us. In our very lives, we are pointing to what God has done through Jesus Christ. It doesn't come from us. It can't. Not because we are so wonderful and not because we are so terrible, but because we are just people. It has to come from God. And it's so critical for the church to listen to this message that Paul is giving. You know, I, I told I told Tim before the service. Every so often, I, I I preach a series on one of the epistles, on one of Paul or Paul's letters, or one of the other disciples' letters. And it's really hard for me because I like narrative better. I like preaching from the Old Testament, from Genesis, from Exodus, from Kings, from from Samuel. I like stories. I like preaching from the Gospels. I like a story. Not, uh, not an argument. <laughs> but I think it's so necessary that we do go back to Paul every so often to hear what he has to say because this is a man who was thinking and living this message of Jesus Christ to the point of, of his own death. And he says it, right? He says, look, I mean, what you are seeing is, is we are not... It's, it's not just not about us, but, but this, this gospel message, we are willing to die for it. And we're willing to live for it. And I think it's so necessary for us to go back to these letters occasionally, probably more than occasionally, 
because they help us to understand what it means to be the church and how we are to focus our our hearts and our eyes and our lives on Christ. You see, what we hear from this one little piece of 2 Corinthians, it, it corrects us. It corrects us from arrogance. It corrects us from arrogance from, it, it, because it reminds us that, that being a Christian, that being a follower of Jesus Christ is not about us. It's not about showing people how good we are. It's not about, about for me or for pastors, it's not about how good of a sermon it is. No, this is about the message that we proclaim. It's about pointing our lives to Jesus Christ. It corrects us from this arrogance that we have by saying, look, I am a Christian, and so look at what a good person I am. It's not about how good of a person I am, it's how good of a God God is. It helps us to rethink that when we are, when we are tempted to go in our own direction and say, I don't want to associate with those people over there because they follow a different a different person or they follow a different ideology, it helps us to remember that, that if we are working towards Christ, even when we disagree, we can love and, and work together. It helps us from our arrogance of being self-centered, but it also, on the other hand, it corrects us from our own low self-esteem, our own debasement. We are more than meets the eye, you see, because the light of God is within us. God has taken up residence. The Spirit of God has taken up residence in us. And God loves us enough to entrust us with God's own presence. God loves us enough to entrust us with the Son of God's life and death and resurrection. God loves us enough to never abandon us, to never give up on us. To keep going with us. It's not about us, but thank God, God loves us enough for all of that. Our lives are not to point to ourselves about how good we are, and they're not to point to ourselves about how bad that we are. Our lives are to point towards the one who has brought life out of death. Who has brought grace and forgiveness and holiness and wonder and beauty. We are so much more than we seem, folks. We are so much more than we seem. Because that's what God has made us. Paul here reminds us to look with the eyes of Christ at ourselves, at our neighbors, and to see in each person someone who God has loved and does love. To see someone that God has sent God's own Son to live and die and live again for. God calls us to see one another as bearers of the Spirit of God. We are more than meets the eye because God is so much more than we could imagine. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of mercy, we humbly ask that you hear us as we lift up our prayers as a community of faith. God of the Sabbath who desires to give us rest, hear the groaning of those to whom rest is unimaginable because their safety is constantly threatened and they are impoverished of their basic needs. Hear the sound of those to whom rest is a reality far away because their hearts are broken with loss, grief, and pain, and their minds and body have grown weary with illness and heavy burdens. Stir us to heed your call as a church and as leaders, as individuals, and as those who are in authority. May we not be troubled by the mountains and the waves of the struggles before us, but may we trust in your extraordinary power. 
as we wait and press forward for the day when rest is assured with justice, healing, and love, grant us a peace that this world cannot give, but can be found only through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. We're still not passing the plate uh, for just a little while longer. We're uh, trying to maintain uh, some safety and and not kind of passing around uh, the collection plate, but we do have uh, we do have a plate in the foyer in the narthex. So if you're here and you're able to give, uh, you can drop that off on the way out. Um, if you are at home and are able to give, you can uh, send a check. You can drop one off. You can have your bank draft to us as well. But if we take a moment to reflect where our rich blessings come from, we know they're from the Lord. So let us acknowledge God as the source of our blessings through offering our gifts and ourselves. Amen. Our closing hymn is To God Be the Glory. It's number 98 in the hymnal. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. Please stand in body or in spirit as we sing together. to join us for Bible study online. We have a Tuesday night Bible study starting at 6.30. Uh, We're currently uh, on the second week, we'll be on the second week of the reading through the book um, Surprised by Hope by N.T. Wright. So if you're interested in joining us, even if you didn't join us for the first one, please do so this week. We would love to have you. All of the information about how to log on is in the bulletin or on our website or on Facebook. So I hope uh, we'd love to see you. But remember, the treasure within these clay jars, our mortal bodies, an extraordinary power beyond our own, the life of Jesus that is being made visible in you. The grace of Christ surround you, the Holy Spirit sustain you, and the peace of God rest upon you, now and always. Amen.
I like that Baroque treatment. 